we will be taking up from the para beginning with even if the truth of our being were a thing less sublime. Well, if you remember, in the previous paragraph, we were actually being given the description and the status of the soul. And as I said, most of this half the paragraph is but a translation of the verses from the Gita, mostly chapter 2, verses 16 to 25. And of course, this is a concept, of course, uh, also based, also given in the Upanishads about the immortality of the soul. And uh, the Gita, of course, puts it a little more dramatically, if I may say so, when it says about that uh, weapons cannot cleave it, nor the fire burn, nor do the waters drench it, nor the winds dry. However, it is giving us a very high and vast uh, and sublime image of the immortality of the soul. Coming to this new para, even if the truth of our being were a thing less sublime, vast, intangible, by death and life, if the self were constantly subject to birth and death, still, the death of beings ought not to be a cause of sorrow. For that is an inevitable circumstance, circumstance of the self, soul's self-manifestation. Its birth is an appearing out of some state in which it is not non-existent but unmanifest to our mortal senses. Its death is a return to that unmanifest world or condition and out of it will again appear in the physical manifestation. Well here of course as you can see he is giving us a different argument. That supposing the soul is really not that sublime that it is you know immortal and it cannot be killed, it cannot be you know, made what he says, uh, it, the fire cannot destroy it, etc., that it is unborn, ancient, and eternal. Supposing that the soul really comes into birth with every time it takes a body. See the difference. The previous one was that it is unborn, ancient, and sem eternal. That means it can never die. But he says, even if it were to really die in the sense that it takes only one body at a time and then goes back, then he says, his birth is an appearing out of some state in which it is, an, it is not non-existent but unmanifest. So supposing it comes from the Ananda Loka or whatever the level of the soul, from that level it comes, takes a body upon earth, lives for a while, leaves the body and goes back to Ananda Loka. This is only a supposition, it's not the truth there. But he's just taking an argument uh, for the sake of the argument. So his death is a return to that unmanifest world or condition and out of it, it will again appear in the physical manifestation. So, so that is not the death of the soul. It is only, it will leave the body and it will go back. The to-do made by the physical mind and senses about death and the horror of death, whether on the sick bed or the battlefield, is the most ignorant of nervous clamors. So what Lord Krishna is telling us is, even if you do not know about this mystery of the soul and all that, even then, to really to be afraid, to be nervous about death by the physical mind and senses about death. See, he uses a very fine description about the physical mind and the senses. What is afraid of death, which is really full of sorrow, it is the physical mind. And the senses, of course the senses, 
he has a, a poem where he says uh, the culling of the rose you know there's a beautiful rose and when it is cut so we feel very bad when we want to cut a beautiful fresh rose so death for us is like that you know it comes and cuts our life for for example a young man is there a bubbling person you know full of life and suddenly if he or she is taken off we feel my god what a cruel thing is this death that it has cut the life off this young person so there what happens is more our senses get the shock and it is our physical mind which really gives all this kind of an explanation that you see it is a cruel thing it is a bad thing it is it is in fact if i want to summarize it is this way that is more our outer nature which gets this shock of death than really our deeper self so what is important is more the the outer being outer mind of man which gets the shock of death because you see when anyone dies in our family the mind and the feelings they are hurt they are in sorrow but the life energy the rhythm of life is so great that you know it continues afterwards death of the person the beloved one becomes a kind of a, a tragic memory but our basic life continues you know people come back to laughter come back to joy come back to seeing movies going to parties you know a thing that you would think oh my god if this person goes away i'll never be able to come back to life i'll be in sorrow for the rest of my life but i've seen people jump back to life sooner or later depending on some circumstance and time but the wave of life takes over so what shobindo indicates here is that the spirit of life is greater than the spirit of death no death can ever stop the wave of life so he wants to tell us it is the outer life outer mind the physical mind which feels the horror of death whether on the sick bed or the battlefield is the most ignorant of nervous clamors our sorrow for the death of men is an ignorant grieving for those for whom there's no cause to grieve since they have neither gone out of existence nor suffered any painful or terrible change of condition but are beyond death no less in being and no more unhappy in that circumstance than in life well here we have again another argument so first of all he said that is more the outer physical mind which feels the shock of death so the shock that we feel the horror that we feel is more on the surface level secondly he says we should not be really having sorrow for the death of men the reason is they have neither gone out of existence nor suffered any painful or terrible change of condition well um, first of all let me put another idea here that is if someone has gone away i mean under this normal circumstances not out of a brutal accident or something those are unholy things you know they really we can't think of that but normally is somebody in the sick bed somebody is the old age somebody some diseases or even somebody pretty young and out of no apparent reason if he or she goes away basically it is the decision of the soul fundamentally and if you realize that there is no cause for sorrow at least i mean there are dozens of cases in the ashram that we have seen and when the mother herself said 
this is what has happened that he or she has gone away because the soul decided you see when i was young we were in the group group in the sense physical activities we had um, not a group mate but other another group a ladies group in fact you know normally in the ashram physical activities we in before the activities begin we have a we stand in a line and then we concentrate and then we go to the activities and at the end of the activities we again stand in line again we thank the mother and disperse so this group of ladies on that day they stood in the line prayed etc and they went to the swimming in the swimming pool in the ashram sports ground and when they remet again made a line the captain of the group noticed that this lady was missing normally is uh, is absolutely a discipline that no one should miss this line so then they suspected something and then they went back to say ladies toilet bathrooms there thinking that maybe she is still taking bath or getting ready but then they found that uh, her uh, towel etc was still in the bathroom so they got a bit panicky and went into the swimming pool apparently there's no one swimming but uh, unfortunately they found a body down the swimming pool at the bottom of the swimming pool and so of course you know the little panicked and people went down dived in and brought up the body etc but the amazing thing was of course at the time the mother was there mother was reported to her well she said it's a soul which decided to leave the body in the quickest mo- manner possible so this girl came out of the swimming pool went into the ladies toilet i mean the rule is first we have to take a shower before we go out of the swimming pool so she took the shower went back into her toilet and ladies toilet and then she came back and normally it is a rule that when we quit the swimming pool we have to sign in and sign out so there was also the signature of her signing out so there's all the proof that she had left the swimming pool she had gone away but yet the body was there how come then what happened that's the thing missing thing was that she had come back and she almost jumped into the swimming pool not that she did not know swimming she was a good swimmer so the mother then she explained this is what happened and because her soul had decided to leave the earth the quickest manner possible maybe because she was young the heart attack was not there so the simple thing was she jumped into the water into the same swimming pool where she had swam 10 minutes before all very well and there was another case also a young my one of my own group mates uh, we go on an on a annual picnic and uh, at that time i wasn't there maybe i left a group by then there is a place you know jinji fort or somewhere and we normally go there and there's a big pool a natural small pool among among the rocks and every young man in the ashram knows swimming so they all jumped into that there's a swimming up and down and this and this and the same thing happened at the end of the day they see the person missing and they really went back and co- it's not a big pool maybe it is as big as this uh, sakar place so it's not that impossible not to look into it so they really dived in dived here dived there but the body also not found anywhere so of course next day the batter went to the mother they said mother we can't even find the body so she said bring me a photograph of the lake or the pond when the photos were brought she said look here she spot spotted the place so of course next day they went they straight went to the spot 
they found the body it was hidden under a rock and the body had really got and got stuck in a rock so people could not see from above only she could see and same thing she said the boy knew very well the swimming but it just that the soul said well i'm quitting and right in the middle of the waters it left the body so there have been umpteen number of cases where she herself explained in fact there was one gentleman who used to see her every time she went to the tennis ground to play tennis and uh, after the game was over he would dive into the sea have a little fresh bath and swim for half an hour and then go back home well that evening he died in the in the sea and mother later said yes when he came to me to do the last pranam i knew today his 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 soul is going to go but she won't say don't go to the swimming pool you you will i mean don't go to the sea you will die if he didn't go to the sea he would be maybe come and come under under car or fall off the wall or anywhere so that is what we have come to know very concretely i mean 95% of the cases are really decisions where the soul dies i mean so it's the soul decides and apparently we think go oh, it's an accident it's a doctor's mistake if the oxygen was there three minutes before all that is our human interpretation and maybe consolation but actually except in the war or when there's there is a a calamity and the suddenly there's an earthquake and a tsunami but they too mother says in 50% of the cases there is a massive death that is also predestined you see in the tsunami why is why is it that this part did not die and that part that died so there is a what she says there's a massive death sometimes the train accidents then there are flights which really fall but out of the 150 passengers maybe three passengers have survived so you see how does it happen because there is the question of a collective death but if those three souls have decided not to live it may be a plane crash or a train crash or a volc- or a, or a tsunami they will survive because their soul said no i don't want to live so they may be injured a backbone broken a leg broken or whatever so you see this is the understanding with which we have grown up the idea i want to tell you is each time in the ashram we were given this kind of a knowledge of death so subsequently what happened not subsequently then as we grew up we have seen our own teachers go away our own colleagues go away some of them are very close friends but never is there any tear in our the physical mind or the what shall we call the senses they do not fear there is no sorrow because we do and we go and pay our homage like it happened latest with dr nathkani's death yes i was there all through and i knew people say oh, it was the heart it was the you know whatever the external reasons so basically what we have to understand is our sorrow for the death of men is an ignorant grieving ignorant grieving because we think of all those things but if you know the truth why should you grieve so that's number one and secondly what shravind is giving here grieving for those for whom there's no cause to grieve because since they have neither gone out of existence nor suffered any painful a terrible change of condition you see the soul has not gone out of existence that means it has only shed its body but the soul itself is not dead it is there perennially and uh, just this morning i was reading something for the mother uh, for my talk in that oroville but the mother says it is the same soul that comes and it is the same formation it comes birth after birth to improve itself so it is not that it is something has left or something is gone out of existence forever so she says we should not have any cause and the person who has departed 
maybe he is in a better condition than he was in this world say if he is suffering from sorrow suffering some kind of a disease and pain after he left the body maybe he is in a better state at least you know that's what had happened to my father he was in a terrible state of physical pain so the family went and prayed to the mother please take him away at least he would be beyond this physical torture and so it happened within 12 hours he was taken away so that's what she was just telling that it is they have so there may be but are beyond death no less in being and no more unhappy in their circumstance than in life but in reality the higher truth is the real truth now he is getting deeper into philosophy where he says all are that self that one that divine whom we look on and speak and hear of as the wonderful beyond our comprehension for after all our seeking and declaring of knowledge and learning from those who have knowledge no human mind has ever known this absolute now this is of course he is getting into vedanta that all are that self that one that divine whom we look on and speak and hear of as a wonderful beyond our comprehension well that is the vedantic approach that here or there in body or without body is a simple straight forward the supreme one i mean that is the condition which we really speak of where everything is the one single supreme so there is you know like saying uh, you know there is this uh, story that uh, once some uh, ministers went to a king and they said uh, oh lord thou art greater than god himself the king was flattered he said why do you say that how can i be greater than god but they said lord you can banish somebody from your kingdom but what can poor god do he cannot banish anybody from his kingdom so that is that lord because for god the whole world is the kingdom i cannot say go away from india to russia from russia to back to this country so you see this is that kingdom of god he is here he is there it's up is here because the whole world is within himself so he says that everything is within so the wonderful beyond our comprehension for after all our seeking and declaring of knowledge and learning who have knowledge no human mind has ever known this absolute so this question of having the knowledge of the full absolute is not possible we as human beings can have partial knowledge but absolute knowledge of the absolute is out of question it is this which is here veiled by the world the master of the body all life is only its shadow the coming of the soul into physical manifestation and our passing out of it by death is only one of its minor movements you see we have to see this immense totality of this life you know when we see for example um, especially in the countries where there is a lot of snow you see what happened the tree apparently dies there's nothing i mean i've seen sometimes in europe in winter the the tree is completely black not a twig not a not a leaf nothing just a little skeleton all black and your thing is all dead but with the first sun ray of the spring you see again the springing in of new life where was that life it is always hidden is only in a different manifest mold so what shrivind is telling us you know this winter and spring and autumn and all that the seasons change but we know when the winter has come spring also will come that when winter we don't think that the tree is completely dead although it may seem to be dead 
now by watching nature we have come to know nothing is dead those green leaves and beautiful twigs have gone into a little shrinking mold and then when the spring comes new leaves come the tree again is born so what shravan is telling us all this is a gigantic movement of withdrawal and a movement of self expression so this withdrawal is called the death and expression is called life so he is saying why are we really in this condition trying to be mournful So it says, when we have known ourselves as this, then to speak of ourselves as slayer or slain is an absurdity. You see the logic here that we cannot say we have been killed or we are dead. It is that which takes this form has has taken it back, shrunk it. Like the again getting back to the image of the tree. the tree in spring has really given maybe for 1 million um, leaves it has expressed itself in such a beautiful manner but when winter comes all these leaves it has shed off and only taken that kind of a mute energy not self expressive so similarly our soul it takes a form is there for one winter one summer one sp- one spring one summer one autumn and then the soul withdraws all this energy so that energy which has gone into a million leaves is the same energy which can gets back into itself becomes what we say the static energy so ultimately we will see that's what i'm telling you from the life divine that there is this energy at rest and energy at expression so energy at rest is called death and energy in expression is called life but it says it's the same energy which is perennially there one thing only is the truth in which we have to live the eternal manifesting itself as a soul of man in the great cycle of its pilgrimage with birth and death for milestones with worlds beyond as resting places with all the circumstances of life happy or unhappy as the means of our progress and battle and victory and with immortality as the home to which the soul travels well this is the sum and substance of our life journey that all our our really birth and death are the milestones of the journey of the soul You see, journey of the soul is not really limited to this one single birth. A journey has begun way back, fifty thousand births back, maybe. But you see, each time it comes, one birth, one death is one milestone. And so each time it puts a peg and says, "Okay, I was there as Mister So and So, Miss So and So," as if kind of puts a peg in a journey and goes on. So what he is saying is our life our earth is the journeying place then the life beyond is his resting place you see every pilgrim has to have both that he walks on the road and he rests on the road so no pilgrim keeps on walking eternally so the soul walks for 70 years 80 years 90 years 30 years 40 years and then says now let me rest and then he says the worlds above are beyond our resting places and the circumstances of life are happy or unhappy as a means of our progress and battle and victory and with immortality as the home to which the soul travels now this third level is where most of us are really bogged down circumstances which are happy or unhappy but these are as means of our progress you see even in our normal journey you know in a, in a physical way we have always sometimes think things which we look forward to so say i must achieve this i must get this i must buy that i must do this there are what we call the short term goals 
But sometimes we don't achieve these short term goals. And yet there are circumstances which change and we say, no, no, all right, I could not achieve that, I'll take another one. So there are all the circumstances are helping us to move forward. Otherwise, if I don't have an aim, a goal, an ambition or somewhere to reach, then I may become little tamasic and, you know, sit in one place and it says, I have nothing much to do. You see, what really kills the persons who are retired is this sense of nothing much to do. Not really the age. Because you see, as the mother explained very often, the sense that my work is complete is the beginning of the, of the coming in of death. So one should never think my work is done. We should always have this kind of a, no, I have one more milestone to go, I have one more mile to cover. So this keeps you moving forward. Well, you will say, well, the ages keep adding, that's true. But age is not necessarily connected to death. You may be 103 years and still look out our Amal Kiran, I don't think he will ever think of death. Well, couple of times uh, somebody asked him, Amal, you're thinking uh, you want to die? Amal said, yes, I want to die. People were surprised that Amal Kiran saying, what has happened? He says, yes, I want to dye my hair. A man of 102 years, he still has a sense of humor. He says, I want to dye my hair. I'm not thinking of death. Who ever said that? That's the spirit. You say, dye your hair means what? You want to look young and be young and want to go forward. So that's it. It's not the question of age. It's not the question of adding years. It's the question of your mind saying, I, my work is done. I have nothing more. So you see, whatever may be your, death, your, your, your decision, your soul's decision, but the fact of the body saying, I have nothing more to achieve, makes the body older, not only older in age, but this whole organ, the mind, the whole system kind of, you know, grinds to a halt. And the more it grinds to a halt, it becomes a hindrance for the soul's expression. So the soul says, wow, look at this body, it's not even helping me to experience anything. So why should I keep this body? So it may leave. So if you have kept the body nice and good and alert and power, you know, energetic, the soul may say, well, the body is really giving me service, I'll use it for longer. So it will not leave it necessarily early. So there are all kinds of things. I mean, what we are saying is not the only way, but these are ways. I mean, different ways of looking at. So these are all means of our progress. And of course, on the spiritual sadhana level, every circumstance becomes a means for inner progress. That we don't have to tell, we have talked about it, but I'll not bring that into picture now. Therefore, says the teacher, put away this vain sorrow and shrinking, fight, O son of Bharata. But wherefore such a conclusion, this high and great knowledge, the strenuous self-discipline of the mind and soul by which it is to rise beyond the clamor of the emotions and the cheat of the senses to true self-knowledge may well free us from grief and delusion. It may well cure us of the fear of death and the sorrow for the dead. It may well show us that those whom we speak of as dead are not dead at all, not to be sorrowed for. Since they have only gone beyond, it may well teach us to look undisturbed upon the most terrible assaults of life and upon the death of the body as a trifle. It may exalt us to the conception of all life circumstances as a manifestation of the one and as a means for our souls to rise themselves above appearances by an upward evolution until we know ourselves as the immortal spirit. Well, uh, as you see with each para, we are getting deeper and deeper into this question of life and death. 
but basically this is uh, you know shobindo commenting based on lord krishna's teachings and you can see some of these things are not there in in the in the bhagavad gita it's sure of indo who is bringing in the explanation he says this high and great knowledge the strenuous self discipline of the mind and soul by which it is to rise beyond the clamor of emotions may well free us from the grief and delusion now it is this kind of a from the calls it strenuous self discipline of the mind it is a self discipline of course to look at death in this manner detached manner thinking that there's no one dies and nothing is dead it's only a question of change of of state so it it can relieve us from grief and delusion it may well cure us of the fear of death and the sorrow for the dead you see to cure us of the fear of death he says in fact the bada would mention that there are four different ways to get out of this fear of death one she says intellectually for those who are thinkers and intellects and have a strong mind you reason out what is death what is life like we are reasoning out here that there's nothing really that goes out of existence it is you know death is something like somebody has gone beyond my sight if somebody say is right on the third floor of sakar i can't see him i can't hear him we cannot communicate but that fellow from up there he is able to see me but i am not able to communicate so i say hey he is dead and gone but he is not dead and gone he is just above there in that floor where he has gone out of your reach of communication but somebody just there on the terrace of sakar i cannot say he is dead and gone he is out of my reach of communication so he instead of living on the ground floor he lives on the third floor but his his existence is still there but now the only question is because they left the body the voice is not there the eyes are not there to look into each other the ears are not there that is the physical instrumentation of communication is not there otherwise his vital being is there his mental being is there his psychic being of course is there so in fact they can communicate i mean they can understand our emotions that's why as often we told that never to cry over, over the dead because vitally they are fully alive except that they don't have the physical to touch you otherwise you know when you are crying they feel you are crying they can hear you are crying they can feel the pull of your crying and that is a disaster for them because say if somebody is crying there and is hey why are you crying i go near and touch him and pat him and and hug him and say don't cry i'm here for you but the mother explained that vital being it cannot come to you with a hand and say hey don't cry so you are adding a kind of a double misery to that soul which has departed one is that it doesn't have the body to communicate secondly with that emotions you are putting greater you know bond on on this vital being and not letting it go so what we say you know he is neither here nor there it is better to be in one place either you are physically here in the physical place with your body or you go to the vital plane because you have still the vital sheet is there you are there in the vital plane but if you pull him what happens he is neither in the vital plane not in the physical plane is hanging in between so the soul departed soul is suffering more so the mother says don't cry don't pull him emotionally in fact we should say no you have left the body go that means you have decided to go go on and go on fast forward may you go to your ananda loka as quickly as possible then i'll be happy i'll pray to the mother ma take this man to ananda loka as fast as possible so our prayers to the divine to take this departed soul to its resting place is the best way we can help a departed soul 
So that's what I'm saying. Intellectually, if you have all this, you can take a positive view. Then if you are emotional, that means you are a bhakta, then you say, no, all this world is the divine. After all, you know, like many of the ashram people would say, oh, this person is dead and, and has gone to the mother. Because we are devotees of the mother, we say, oh, he has gone to the mother's feet. So we feel undisturbed. He says, after all, he was here with the mother and is there with the mother. So it's fine with me. So if you are a bhakta, you do that. Then she would say, if you are um, a yogi, then you know that there is nothing as here and there, before and after, that there is only one kind of a creation. There is only all one energy. It is like Lord Krishna says, taking one form, living one form. So there is a kind of a yogic understanding. However, there is a fourth one I forget now. So there is this kind of an understanding by which you can get away from the fear of death. So it may well show us that those whom we speak of as dead are not dead at all, not to be sorrowed for, since they have only gone beyond, that, that's what I was explaining, they have gone beyond your reach, not, nothing more. It may well teach us to look undisturbed upon the most terrible assaults of life and upon the death of the body as a trifle. So once, you know, we have this kind of an attitude, then one of the greatest fears of life, which is the fear of death, I wouldn't say so easily that we'll conquer it, but at least we'll not be that much affected that we get into deep depression or into vairagya and you say it's gone and I'm gone. That extreme emotional disturbance we could avoid if we have this kind of a knowledge. It may exalt us to the conception of all life circumstances as a manifestation of the one and as a means for our souls to raise themselves above appearances. So that's what I said as a yogi. You say all this is one energy. Do you think when the ashram people died, mother and or Shurabindu were affected? No. It was as simple as news. Sometimes she would say, yes, I knew. The soul actually first came to me and then I said, Mother, I'm leaving the body. And it left. Sometimes mother would say, you are leaving it too early, go back. I have some work for you. I think some other day I was telling you about Amrita. Amrita was one of those souls whose life was extended by 25 years. The soul had decided to leave, but mother said, I have some more work, please don't leave the body, go back. So sometimes you see that is one of the things even if the soul wants to leave and the body is good state mother may say hey boy you have been doing good work and I want you to do more. So she, it, she may tell the soul to return but to the body but if the body is crumpled full of disease, full of ailments, full of this thing the soul may say well I can't do that. Once or twice she tried to do that with the body that had an accident, the soul wanted to stay on, but the body was too bad, too much, you know, it broken and the, it could not go back. Mother tried to keep it here for a while and then send it back, it could not. So there are all circumstances possible. So he's saying here that this is how we may really see that all our souls, I mean, is a means for our souls to raise themselves above appearances by an upward evolution until we know ourselves as the immortal spirit. But how does it justify the action demanded of Arjuna and the slaughter of Kurukshetra? Now here, suddenly we seem to change the scene. I mean, we have talked about death, not to have this kind of an attitude, not to be surprised by this changing of the state of the body, but then Sri suddenly is bringing the question, how does all this justify the slaughter of Kurukshetra? But apparently it's quite a, I would say, incongruous 
the way Sri Aurobindo is explaining about the death and the suffering and all that, but he is bringing in the question of Kurukshetra because this is exactly what Arjuna had asked for. If you remember in the beginning, Arjuna said, all these people are going to be killed and I don't want to kill them. So now Sri Aurobindo is saying that death in Kurukshetra How is it justified now? So the answer here is, the answer is that this is the action required of Arjuna in the path he has to travel. It has become inevitably in the performance of the function demanded of him by Swadharma. His social duty, the law of his life and the law of his being. Well, coming back to the first answer, what Lord Krishna gives that now life or death is not to be looked into because you, O Arjuna, are a Kshatriya. And Kshatriya is not afraid of death, his own or others. He has been trained to kill and to be killed. So for him this life and death are equal. So he's saying, why are you being philosophic now? You are a Kshatriya. Go ahead and do your duty. Nothing to think about. Then he says, this world, this manifestation of the self in the material universe is not only a cycle of inner development, but a field in which the external circumstances of life have to be accepted as an environment and an occasion for that development. Now here comes the very, I mean this whole approach that you will see is a very pragmatic approach. For once Arjuna, the Kshatriya, was becoming a kind of a thinker, which he was not supposed to do in the battlefield. There you don't go into the battlefield and start thinking about, you know, philosophy and Vedas and Upanishads. You are there to act, a man of action. So here he is saying that in fact, that this field in which the external circumstances of life have to be accepted as an environment and an occasion for that development. So you're saying, look, this entire world is, of course, as we have said, is a journey of the soul. This entire worldly existence, creations, is continuously the soul is marching from birth to birth, from birth to birth, acquiring whatever it has to acquire, experience and this and that. So that is a field of inner development, but also a field in which the external circumstances have to be accepted. Now you see, by your training, by your background, you are in the battlefield. So you have to accept the circumstance and not run away from it saying, no, no, my wife is waiting for me at home, my children are looking for me. You can't do that. Not only is it non, I mean, it's an an ideal that goes against the Kshatriya, but maybe the divine has put you in these circumstances for your best, for your best inner growth. In fact, that is what we were told when we were in the ashram and the mother was there in the body, that whatever work she gave was for the individual the best way to progress inwardly. Maybe an artist she would put into the into the furniture shop, into the furniture department. Artist may say, hey mother, I wanted to really paint for 10 hours a day, you have put me in the furniture shop there. But externally, yes, it may be a jerk. But inwardly, that may be the best possible way for your inner growth. So what lot of this sadhaks of yore were given to understand and have also written in their memories that how they were expecting something different according to the so-called sabhava. Like for example our own Niroddha he was a medical man but he was put in for a while in the, in the furniture uh, shop there, department. So mother did not really go by your, necessarily by your external thing, hey, if he's a lecturer, then put him in the school for all his life, then he can lecture and go forward. But maybe being a lecturer will bring you a greater ego. 
you may think you are the man of knowledge and you know you are getting to be a greater professor a popular man and your ego may boost which may be a great hindrance to your sadhana so she who knows uh, so the lecturer may be put into a dining room that's what our present dining room in charge is he was a lecturer from punjab or i don't know which place but when he came to here he came here for the first couple of years he taught us and i was a student and he was the best teacher because he told us all his stories and you know children they like only the storyteller so he used to come and tell us and i still remember i don't know when it was 1964 34 years back something or 44 years back he was the first one who told us the story of amrit mantan and i you know today in the morning those who were there in the morning at oroville manoj da told you in 5 minutes about amrit mantan but this gentleman told us a whole week i mean he would come every day 40 minutes he would tell the story but the way he would describe the details and the evil the demon side and the god side and he would relish telling the story and we as children he, i mean he gave us such a great joy you can imagine that it is 36 plus 8 44 years hence also i still remember the story given by amrit by vijay at that time so obviously when a teacher gives you that kind of a joy you remember so that gentleman who was a teacher was later on said well get going you go into the dining room and mother gave him that place not that in the beginning also he was in the dining room but he was given a few classes in the in the school and the higher course but subsequently his work became so much that he had to leave the classes that's fine but what i mean is the circumstances have to be accepted as the best for your inner growth today the mother is not there in the physical fine but sometimes in, in her own grace with an with invisible hands she puts you in the circumstance which is best for you so it is not the just question of you know surrendering to your fate because in india we'll say oh everything is karma because of karma i'm doing that but i tell you you cannot be so easily accepting your karma if you can consciously accept it it is a great step in life because you are surrendering to your deeper being so it is this kind of an inner surrender which is of great importance so so sure i'm just writing us writing that you have to accept as an environment and occasion for that development is a world of mutual help and struggle not a serene and peaceful gliding through easy joys is a progress it allows us but every step has to be gained by heroic effort and through a clash of opposing forces well uh, there's a little more i think i would take a break at this point we'll uh, resume after this short break